What's going on, everybody? It's 3.07 p.m. and it's Wednesday, August the 25th, 2021. And I'm going to go ahead and let you know this one is going to be a little long. You can see these tabs at the top. This is almost exclusively XRP and Ripple related. Um, I missed the video yesterday. I was just busy. I had to pick my dog's ashes up from the crematorium. I had the kids with me and it just... We got, you know, we ended up having some photo shoots and some other things that went on. So, uh, yeah, I just did not have time. So, you're getting an extra long video today. Hopefully, you can make it to the end. Um, yeah, let's just jump into this thing. So, uh, make sure you guys are following me at True Perception 3 on Twitter. It is greatly appreciated. The following took a big boost. Thanks to XRP Trends allowing me to hop on their post. I still have to follow some of you guys back. I Sorry I haven't participated in the whole follow train you guys are running. I've just been swamped. I will get to it. Um, make sure here over at the channel when you get done with the video, make sure you like, hit the subscribe button. If you haven't already, make sure the notification bell has been clicked so you'll get all the updates when I drop fresh new uh, content, which happens daily most of the time, sometimes a couple times a day. Um... We got playlists. I need to go update them, but there's still some interesting stuff. Make sure you check out the ET playlist. This is Eric Thomas. This is where I put a lot of the motion, motivational videos that I like to watch. If you're into that sort of thing, make sure you check him out, man. He's like the, he's number one in the world. He's fantastic. Uh, here's the About section. If you want to donate to the channel, you can donate all these supported assets. Uh, you can send it to directly to trueperception.crypto from within supported wallets like Coinbase Wallet, I believe Descent. There's a few other ones. Um, here's all the links. I got a private Facebook group. I have had one of you guys join. Shout out to you. Um, it's been cool. We're conversating and stuff. It's probably the most active other person in the group other than me at this point. Um, I got all my referral links. I got uh, my OpenSea account. That's kind of dead. I mean, if you go there and you want to buy one of my NFTs or my domains, let me know. But a lot of that is going to get uh, migrated at some point. All right, so... Here we have from Politico, crypto lobby has handed setback as House blocks tax rule changes. The House Rules Committee agreed to a process that would prohibit any amendments from being considered in the infrastructure bill. House Democrats on Tuesday blocked attempts to scale back digital currency tax rules tucked into President Joe Biden's infrastructure plan in a new setback for the crypto industry advocates fighting the proposal. Uh, the House Rules Committee, which drafts the terms of debate for bills headed to the floor, agreed to a process that would prohibit any amendments from being considered for the infrastructure bill. The House voted 220 to 212 to lock in the procedure through a resolution approved on Tuesday afternoon. The plan also sets up a floor vote on the infrastructure package by September 27th. Um, make sure you guys check out that article. There's some more information in there, but you get the gist of it. And again, this is just kind of touching on it more. Uh, I am committing to pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill by September 27th. I do so with a commitment to rally House Democratic support for its passage. That is Nancy Pelosi. They are trying to speed this thing up. That's my opinion. Um, uh, it's crazy. The Blockchain Association, our 46 member companies in the newly energized nationwide crypto community, will rededicate our energy to supporting technology neutral pro crypto legislation and regulation on this specific tax issue as well as broader crypto policy. I love that. Make sure you check out the video. Bitcoin apparently is back above 49,000, too, by the way, as this little, uh, uh, what do you call it, widget would say here. The uh, the market is pretty green today. We're not, I'm not going to touch on TA or anything today. There's too much news to go over. Coinbase executive slams crypto provisions of the infrastructure bill and gives a list of suggestions for lawmakers. Uh, today, around 60 million Americans own crypto, roughly one-fifth of the entire population. Those Americans in the entire crypto ecosystem deserve more dialogue than midnight provisions inserted at the last minute. Tax policy should be thoughtful and deliberate. Broad overreach is a regulatory mistake. This will harm innovation and stifle the potential of a hugely important technology in its earliest stages of development. If Congress decides that it must create a new definition of broker within the infrastructure bill for digital assets, then it should define brokers as persons who act as middlemen for compensation with customers as counterparties. This is a traditional definition of broker and would cover entities such as Coinbase. And I agree with that. Um, you know, the entire space is speaking out. The one thing is, is that about crypto, we got apple juice today, guys. The one thing about a crypto is that um, we are passionate, man, and I consider myself pretty damn passionate about it, but some of these people, like, fighting on the forefront, you know, they are, like, diehard passionate, and a uh, shout-out to all of them for fighting a the good fight. Uh, the CFTC commissioners 
Stump decries oversimplification or decrees oversimplification that crypto is either a security or a commodity. The CFTC has jurisdiction only when looking at futures or other derivative products. Um, you know, in her statement, she described a grossly inaccurate oversimplification that digital assets are either securities or commodities that fall under the jurisdiction of the CFTC. If they are deemed to be securities, they would be regulated by the SEC. Because the CFTC doesn't regulate commodities themselves, only future contracts or derivative products like swaps. Some said it doesn't matter whether digital assets are classified as securities or commodities because they wouldn't fall under the authority of the CFTC unless a futures or derivatives contract was involved. We all know that there's a tug of war going on here between the bunch of government agencies. Uh, this I thought was cool. I don't know if it's SEBI, I guess is how you say it. SEBI asked depositories to use... Distributed ledger technology to monitor security creation. The information stored in the system will be cryptographically signed, timestamped, and sequentially added to the ledger. It would provide a verifiable audit trail of transactions. I'm not going to read this entire article, but DLT is what Ripple does, and they do it better than anybody else. My opinion, take it or leave it, don't really care. Um, I think this is awesome. They are talking about... Um, using centralized databases and how this is more resilient than that, especially how it offers much more protection against certain types of cyber attacks because of its distributed nature, which removes a single point of attack. Um, we all know that like the government's been getting hammered with all these ransomware and all this craziness that's going on. The State Department just got hacked. I haven't heard a single thing about that since it was announced, which I also find extremely interesting. Um, yeah, so this is awesome. I think the more people that adopt DLT, with, and this doesn't have Ripple, Full disclosure, Ripple's not written on here, guys. It's not even mentioned, and neither is XRP. But just the fact that the type of technology is being used is promising, in my opinion, for Ripple and for crypto at large. Um, before I get too far in the video, let's just go ahead and get this out of the way. Nothing that is said or shown here is financial advice, tax advice, investment advice, or any advice other than the possible and occasional uh, personal growth advice that I may give. Do not buy or sell anything based on anything you see or read or hear on this channel. That would be a terrible idea. Make sure you do all your own research. Vet all your sources, sources including me and anybody else that you watch on YouTube, Twitter, or any other outlets. It is your responsibility to make educated decisions with your investments in your money. Nobody else's. Moving on. Uh, XRP has more reason to moon as Ripple proposed a smart contract capability for XRPL. Now, they're referring to the uh, federated sidechains. And it says here, it would, uh, a new addition is the very beneficial for the cryptocurrency community is they would be able to operate a side chain to the XRPL easily. The main focus of federated side chains is to let developers implement more amazing features such as smart contracts. Moreover, the developers of XRP will also have an opportunity to conduct trials on a side chain while utilizing the complete power of the ledger. The rapidly growing decentralized finance space and smart contracts popularity are the main reasons behind the introduction of the federated side chains. Furthermore, David has also stated the software name Federator is going to serve as a bridge between Sidechain and the XRPL. The concept would allow each Sidechain to have its own ledger and transactions, as well as a federation system that allows XRP and Sidechain-issued tokens, for example, Bitcoin, Fiat, CBDCs, to move from one Sidechain to another. XRP will be used as the native token to power the main XRPL as usual. In addition, XRP can be used as the native token for running the sidechains or any application built on the sidechains may also opt to issue their own tokens which are compatible with XRPL. These new tokens shall be named Federated Assets. Federated Assets imported into XRPL itself would trade on the XRPL's integrated decentralized exchange. XRP imported on the sidechains would be used for liquidity on the XRPL integrated DEX as well. This is big stuff, guys. Um, I love it. I love it all. Um, can the SEC Ripple's lawsuits or can the SEC Ripple lawsuits fact discovery deadline be key to the price actions? Um, they're saying is XRP in trouble, and it says no more than usual. The parties are still going back and forth, compelling one another to do this, that, and the other. The parties have moved jointly for brief extension of fact discovery deadline and to extend expert discovery deadline until November 12th, 2021. And I'm going to show where James Fallon says, if you thought this thing was getting settled in the near future, in his opinion, you should, uh, you should table that ideology because he does not think it's happening. He, he's expressed before this thing could run into the spring 
very easily, even if it is a settlement that is issued. And I do believe if it goes into trial, you could see it go as far as spring, maybe even early summer before anything is done. Uh, they talk about, I'm not going to cover where the price is going. I don't like getting into price calls and stuff, but I will put the link in the description as usual. Ripple is also using a letter to retail investor in the SEC lawsuit over XRP sales. Um, this goes into it a little bit. Uh, somebody had sent them a mail and he says, thank you for your recent email to the U.S. securities. Let me see. Yeah, he asked the regulator to bid to understand what they thought was a security or not because there was no decision. He was trying to make an educated decision on what to purchase. And they responded with, we appreciate the opportunity to review your additional concerns about Ripple XRP cryptocurrency. Please be advised the SEC has not issued a determination on whether the cryptocurrency XRP is a security. Whether a crypto is considered security will depend on the characteristics and the use of the cryptocurrency itself. As we have suggested, you may want to review Chairman Jay Clayton's statement regarding cryptocurrencies and initial coin offerings at, and then they go to that. So right here, they couldn't even give the guy an answer. There's no yes or no. I mean, they're not helping at all. That's not helpful. Get into this, this little gem. Apparently, Grayscale has been allowed by the SEC to run and sell an XRP trust for years. This was done using the exact same form and the exact same information as Ethereum. Can someone explain to me how this should be possible when the SEC says that XRP, unlike Ethereum, is an illegal security? And we'll just pull these up real quick so you can look at them. If, if you want to like really focus on this, make sure you pause the video. I'm trying to move quick so this isn't an hour long. But you see right here, within the last five years, 2018... It's been running, guys. I mean, it's pretty crazy. It's a grayscale XRP trust. It's like, it was okay for them to do it. Imagine that, not grayscale. They don't get free passes around here, do they? Sorry if that was a little too quick. Hopefully you're able to pause that. I kind of got excited to move on from that business there. Uh, the Ripple vs. SEC settlement hopes falter as parties move to extend discovery deadline. We just went over that. That's literally what I was just saying. Um, in my experience, anyone who thinks this case is selling anytime soon should reconsider, and that is what he says. Uh, Judge Torres has yet to rule on the Ripple executive's twin motions to dismiss the case and XRP holder's motion to intervene. So, And then there's the ongoing discovery disputes that keep getting extended. So while I do say on the face value it looks like this thing could drag out for a while, I, I wouldn't be so sure as he is. And I don't know that he's saying definitively or not, but I, I have all kinds of weird feelings. Um, so we got a bunch of videos we're going to watch, guys. Some of these are a little longer than the others. Um, bear with me. I mean, some of you probably won't make it all the way through. Some of you will. Um, in this deposition, Hinman attempts to minimize the impact of his June 14th speech on market participants, even though, or the, uh, to minimize the impact his speech had on market participants, even though there exists videos of Hinman and others saying the opposite. Check this out. And this was posted by Digital Asset Investor. Shout out to him. Make sure you're following him on Twitter or YouTube, whatever. He posts fantastic content. Uh, the SEC was using Hinman to provide guidance to the market with his Ethereum speech. Hinman filed a sworn affidavit in court saying the SEC still has still, the SEC has still not taken any position or expressed a view. Interesting, right? Listen to this. The most helpful thing, I think, our director of corporation finance, Bill Hinman, gave a speech about a year and a half ago that describes this. You might know the, uh, the speech I have in mind. That's it. So the question is, where do we draw that line? And the how we test and the guidance we put out in this area has informed that difference. Now, one more thing. You, you mentioned cryptocurrency. What's important about that is to realize that um, the way that cryptocurrency works when it is, and this is what Bill Hinman's speech says, so I'm not adding too much, um, depends fundamentally on how centralized or decentralized the underlying network is that, um, um, that supports um, uh, that currency. Um, and that's, that's also true in the ICO context. Bill has said a lot about that, about that, ways that practitioners can look in that area and get a sense for, um, for whether or not we should think of that as a security. And um, I point people to that speech. Do you think we've been clear enough about that? No. Yeah. Yeah, I expected you to say that. Now, let me ask you this. No, 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 seriously. I've heard that a lot. What could we do that would be more clear? I want to be clear because a lot of people have come in and asked us for more guidance on this. And it's not that I, we don't want to be, I, I won't speak to my colleagues, not that I don't want to be responsive. It's that I worry that if we make a rule today, 
it will make a lot less sense to the marketplace in six months in this space. Do you see what I'm worried about? And better for worse, the machinery of the bureaucracy of the US government works in a fashion where if I were to pitch a rule and know exactly what it was, exactly um, what we, if you and I could get a beer and agree what the rule should be, by the time it became law, it'd be a year late. And by that time, the ground will have moved underneath us. So that, if you sense, at least from my point of view, uh, 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 wanting to give this some time to figure out and do it by guidance as opposed to rule, that's what's driving us. The most. So he's essentially saying that crypto is moving too fast for them to give clear guidance on because by the time they issue clear guidance, the rules in the ground would have changed. It makes absolutely no sense. Basically, it just comes down to being unintentionally or intentionally vague. Um, this is significant. Phenomenal article on Visa News NFT purchase. Old institutions see NFTs as a future of e-commerce. This is kind of out of place. I forgot that I meant to actually delete this. I wasn't going to cover it. But their point was how it took 10 years for institutions to start adopting Bitcoin, but only one year to embrace NFTs. This may be the most important signal in the history of the market. Expect acceleration. I'm all here for that. Um, and then here's John Deaton. He, is, he runs the uh, crypto law page here. That's his law firm. Uh, this guy's amazing. And he says, what is the fairness defense in SEC versus Ripple? And why is it important to all crypto holders? And let's hear what he has to say in this short clip. You can click down below here if you want to, or look this up anyway, if you want to watch the uh, full, full thing. What's that say? It basically says, SEC, you don't have jurisdiction. You're out of business. So that's why the SEC is taking this extraordinary step to go to the court and say, Ripple shouldn't even be allowed to argue this to the fact finder. Judge, you shouldn't even consider this, okay? Because um, it's game over. It's game over, guys. Uh, from the SEC's complaint against Ripple, economic reality dictates that XRP purchasers have no choice but to rely on Ripple's efforts for the success or failure of their investment. Meanwhile, here's the response from Economic Reality. And this shows here that people are buying equity from Uphold um, via, well, via Uphold from Link2 at, uh, with XRP. Sorry, I got a little distracted there. My daughter was crying. Um, and just, you can't buy a security with a security, guys. Just putting that out there. That's why that's in there. Um, it says, or the time for relevant clarity once and for all. The SEC is basically admitting they can't create regulations for a market that moves as quickly as crypto does. It is time for them to step aside. That's what I was just touching on on the thing before. And then here is a article from back in July, which I had covered, but I'm going to include it again, where it talks about how Ripple test is what might be replacing the Howey test as far as uh, digital assets and the like go. We'll see what happens there. I'm not going to cover this again, but it, again, description. Um, this guy says, if 14 weeks is too far in the future in the crypto space, why would the Howey test be relevant today? It is very clear that the SEC intentionally left it unclear so they can benefit from the gray area. Oh, so many snakes. And crypto law chimes in correct. A clear SEC rule in 2019 would be irrelevant in 18 months, but a 1946 court decision off a 1933 law somehow fully applies to cryptocurrencies, blockchain architecture, and digital assets. This just might be my thumbnail today. I love that. Um, again, he says, listening to this, and they're referring to some of the clips that we're watching. Listening to this, you can hear him basically say they couldn't make rules that would be relevant in weeks or even months. So are we to understand that no one at the SEC could competently do their job? They were actually feckless. I don't know if that's supposed to say feckless or reckless. I don't know if that's even a word. To design fair regulations. Man, this is shameful. And it says, indeed, the SEC's official approach assumed that a clear rule would lose relevance in 18 months. Well, how could the market have known that XRP was a security back in 2013 then? Or how, even if it was, how would you know that year after year, 18 month periods, it would remain a security? Or if it wasn't, how do you know it would remain a non-security? It's just totally vague, man. They know what they're doing. Uh, on August 20th of 19, Brad Garlinghouse pleads with Jay Clayton for clarity on XRP and gets none. In November On November 19th of the same year, Clayton avoided setting clear rules on crypto in order to give market guidance instead. And then on 12-22, the SEC says, we all should have known XRP was a security in 2013. 
um, and he's got a clip here from giving from a digital asset investor that says giving guidance to the market instead of rules via speeches like Bill Hinman's was the SEC strategy. But he told the court it was just his opinion. Robert Jackson, the ex-SEC commissioner under Jay Clayton, lays it out. And if that's the case, that is lying, guys. That is perjury. You are you're literally under oath during your depositions. So this is going to get interesting. I've had many folks come to me since I took office at the SEC and say, Commissioner Jackson, you should adopt a rule um, uh, uh, regarding ICOs, regarding crypto. And I say to them every time I see them, what would that rule look like today? And they describe it. And I say, okay, in the very best case, I can get from start to finish on that rule in 14, 15 months. Can you assure me that in 14 months this will be the right rule? Can you assure me that in 14 weeks it will be the right rule? And the answer is no. That means that from time to time, the SEC does its best work not through the cumbersome and formal rulemaking process, but instead by talking to the marketplace. Um, it's a dirty word in Washington right now, but we do this thing that I, as a practicing lawyer, when I was at Wattel Lipton for some time, always valued very much, which was the ability to get guidance from the staff about what their expectations are and why. That, that process enables us to talk to the market, hear from solid practitioners who are developing the most cutting edge solutions to. Um, to business problems and give them feedback about the questions that might arise under the securities laws as a consequence of those choices. I think that um, so far it is fair to say our efforts in the, um, uh, in the cryptocurrency space, in the ICO space, and that most cutting edge challenges we face have been by going this route. A case by case careful determination uh, through communications with industry about what we're comfortable with and where we would have questions. And I actually think it has so far been one of the finest moments um, uh, under uh, my, my terrific chairman, Jake Layton, because we have taken a measured, balanced, careful approach that reflects what we do well, which is to talk to the market about what's happening. Um, I don't yet have the sense that the market is in a position where we could pursue a cumbersome rulemaking and be confident that we would be making a rule that would make long-run sense for the market in many of the areas you've talked about today. And what we cannot do, and I think must not do, is develop rules on these cutting edge subjects that we've been discussing all day today. Let me tell you something, I don't know about you guys, but people that move around a lot when they talk are usually hustling you. Um, I believe that to be fact. I'm a very observant person. My father raised me to be as such. And uh, yeah, I ain't buying none of this guy's bullshit. Anyway, um, on April 30th, Clayton has been very clear that he hasn't seen one ICO that isn't a security. I'm with him. Then in June of the same year, well, Ethereum's not a security, even though it had an ICU. Him and Jackson said the speech was market guidance. Fair notice or market confusion? It's crazy, guys. Listen to this. Where are you, by the way, on Bitcoin talking about ICOs? It's a, a little, little bit different, but in the same, in, in, in the same lane. Well, look, if I were to give investing advice on uh, Bitcoin, it's not something I can do in my current role, and it also be worth what you paid for it. What I'll say about Bitcoin in general is that um, that space, as I hinted earlier, has been full of troubling developments that we've seen at the SEC and especially the ICO space. That makes me worry that we're having a hard time, or I should say investors are having a hard time, telling the difference between investments and fraud. What could the SEC do to, to make it clearer? Well, we've been doing a lot in the ICO space. So uh, the chairman, Jay Clayton, has been very good about this. He has been out there very clearly, and this is what he said, and I agree with him. He said that he hasn't seen an ICO yet that's not a security. Um, and we get all kinds of different manifestations and proposals, and I'm with him. I haven't seen one of these yet that's not a security. You know, one of the things about ICOs that's interesting is if you want to know what our markets would look like with no securities regulation, what it would look like if the SEC didn't do its job, the answer is the ICO market. Is, is that suggest, though, that you're about to regulate this market? Or does that suggest you're about to ban this market? It doesn't suggest either of those things. Uh, what I would say is it suggests that we are right now focused on protecting investors who are getting hurt in this market. And down the road, I think we will be thinking about, I think we should be thinking about, ways to make those investments work consistent with our security. When you say you're, you're right now trying to protect those investors, how are you doing that? Well, we've been very focused on enforcement in that space. And I'll tell you, I've only been at the SEC for three months, but the folks in enforcement who are bringing those cases are doing extraordinary work protecting investors from the kind of fraud that you see in that space. 
Yeah, whatever, dude. That guy is full of it. Um, we got Tony Edward on how he was affected by the SEC versus Ripple and how the XRP holders. Uh, I'm an XRP holder, and I was affected, and and I lost value in my investment as a result of the SEC's move and the fact that they wouldn't even address it or talk about it. Like, hey, XRP investors, while this is happening, et cetera, et cetera, we're taking a look. There's nothing. It's just radio silence and. Once again, it gives the impression that, okay, you're the little people. We, we, we don't care. Uh, I'm an XRP holder, and I was affected. Yeah, because that's exactly what's going on, guys. It's a big money game. Uh, fair notice for market confusion. Here's Robert Jackson said that the Hinman speech was market guidance. Today in court, the SEC says it was not market guidance. Robert Jackson, then commissioner of the SEC, Hinman gave a speech where he laid out Here's how we think about this. I think we've, Hinman's speech and the chairman's work in this has moved the market toward a great deal. It was not Hinman's opinion. So just listen. Nothing in the nature of a cryptocurrency, the nature of the asset itself that gives you pause. It's the structure of the markets those assets are traded in rather than features of the asset itself. Is well, that's that exactly thing? right. That's very fair, Rob. And let me add one more uh, about crypto in particular. The other question we face that is very challenging is, is this a security and to what degree is it a security under the securities laws? And I think, I'll be honest, I think my colleagues have done a great job about this. Mm. Um, the director of our division of corporation finance is a man named Bill Hinman who did, an he, he gave a speech where he laid out, here's how we think about this. Um, and gave a set of principles that the market can follow in understanding, here's how you know if you have a security or if you don't. Now, we haven't answered every particular question, um, but we've answered a lot. And I'll say one more thing about this. Early in this market, some lawyers out on the West Coast, mm -hmm. in my view, got out ahead of their skis. They gave advice that these things were not securities. And candidly, um, my reaction as a lawyer and human was reading the, that advice, it was uh, aggressive. Mm. As a result of that, the regulator has a job to do, which is to say to the bar, you know the principles here, you know the rules of the game, and you should apply them carefully and faithfully to the advice you're giving. And I think uh, we Hinman's speech and, and the chairman's work in this has moved the market forward a great deal. Uh, uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, here we go again. Fair notice or market confusion. I mean, guys, it just keeps going on and on and on. So Bill Hinman gave a terrific speech last fall where he outlined some of those principles, um, and did a good job guiding the market. Let's see what he says here. This guy's crazy. Uh, even before I got in the commission, Jay Clayton stamped that out. And he came forward and said, um, if you want to raise money on an ICO basis, you're almost certainly going to have to comply with the securities laws, and here's how that looks. Um, and then we started digging into the harder questions about um, how do the securities laws apply, for example, to cryptocurrencies? Um, are they likely to be securities when they're first issued or when they're decentralized? Uh, will there be a different view? Uh, and I think um, uh, Bill Hinman gave a terrific speech uh, last fall where he outlined some of those principles um, and did a good job guiding the market. Um, now, my guess is a lot of people on this call think the SEC could do even better in providing more guidance uh, in this area. And let me say something about that. I hear you and I don't think you're wrong, but it is very, very difficult for the government to keep up with a market that's changing at the speed that that market is changing. Um, and that's particularly true when we have some folks on the commission right now who are very hesitant about the use of guidance. Um, in other words, um, we've got a lot of people um, who are not so sure that the staff should be providing informal views or guidance to folks um, uh, in the way that's sometimes necessary to keep up with a fast moving market. And Tom, let me promise you something. If we had passed a rule on cryptocurrency um, uh, or on ICOs or what have you, um, in 2017 or 2018, that rule would have been obsolete the day we voted on. Because that market is simply moving too fast uh, for people to believe that, um, uh, that a rulemaking process uh, could keep up with it. Um, so my own view is that the SEC has done a very good job in that area um, and that that market now has a lot more depth and liquidity and price discovery uh, than, than it did when I was on the commission. Uh, and I think that we'll, be get, we'll begin to move in a direction where um, uh, uh, the commission will provide more clear views to the market about what that uh, space should look like. I think the SEC has done a fantastic job as well if you're part of the White Shoe Club. But I think if you're you and I, or at least most of my viewers, I'm sure, in a similar boat as me, I think they've done a terrible job. I don't know that you could do much worse. Um, 
Judge Netburn has scheduled a telephonic conference for August 31st at noon to discuss the pending privilege dispute over Ribble's motion to compel the SEC to produce discovery documents repeatedly ordered by the court. The SEC has refused every time, even though they've been ordered twice. Call details have yet to be issued. We will definitely be covering that. Uh, here is Mark Cuban responding to Mr. Gensler, who says the spirit of the law is about protecting investors. Our rigorous enforcement regime at the SEC is about following the facts and the law wherever they may lead on behalf of investors and working families. And Mark Cuban says this is such bullshit. You didn't start the BS. Please don't continue it. If you are working on behalf of investors, you make it easy for questions by investors and business people to be asked and answered. You make it nearly impossible. Those can't afford lawyers can only guess. And yeah, I, I relate to that. Uh, he also says if someone asks a lawyer, accountant, or advisor if something is over the line, maybe it's time to step back from the line. Going right up to the edge of a rule or searching for some ambiguity in the text of a, or a footnote may not be consistent with the law and its purpose. Mark Cuban responds to Gensler and says, how about making the lines bright and clear so people know what the rules are? The problem isn't that people are looking for gray areas, it's that there rarely are defined rules. Regulation through litigation traps all the people who can't afford a lawyer, accountant, or advisor. Um, one second, guys, I was writing something down. Just so I could, part of my title, I had an idea and I don't want to lose it. Um, here you got Jeremy Hogan. This is where they touched on the guy who had the... Um, the email that we shared earlier, just two months before the lawsuit, they were not able to issue guidance about XRP then to this guy who asked for it. It's just playing into the same narrative we're covering. Um, they're also trying to get the Slack communications from uh, Ripple, the SEC is. And here's where Arthur Brito is making it clear that Ripple does not influence the XRP price, at least not directly. This suggests that Ripple executives got great legal advice back in the day. He said good, I'm saying great. Their legal team's ridiculous. Um, you know, and they're talking about gateways this and gateways that. And he says, in general, Ripple Labs doesn't want to provide financial advice or give anyone false expectations for the value of XRP. As such, you should not expect any guidance from Ripple Labs on these topics, especially as Ripple Labs does not control the value of XRP. I personally believe a sign of being overly invested in the asset is being overly concerned about the value. This was September 30th of 2015. So this is a long time ago when they were telling people like, look, we're not going to give you advice and it's not up to us for the value to go up. Here we have Digital Asset Investor coming through with all the fire still. This video is filled with his clips. Hinman filed a sworn affidavit in court saying the SEC has still not taken any position or expressed a view on Ethereum's status. Let's, and he tagged Brad Garlinghouse from Ripple. Let's watch this. I think uh, the chairman and the SEC has been following this area carefully. They've been watching developments. Um, I think we've been tr careful not to react too quickly or to overreact to things. Uh, and we... In the case of Ether, as we see it develop, as we interact with market participants who are engaged um, in Ether transactions, you know, we g keep gathering information. And at some point, we say to ourselves, well, this is something that we should make clearer uh, in its current state. We don't see value regulating that. So we're trying to be uh, transparent and practical as we uh, provide more guidance. Of all the many things that I'm proud to work, have worked with Jay Clayton on, I am most proud of what the team did to get out ahead of the ICO issue, to be clear that we were, we were going to be forceful about the limits of the law. I think that was difficult as a matter of leadership for Jay to do it. I think it was the right thing to do. I think the team that he put in place did it just right, and I'm very proud of it. Um, now that we've gotten past that part, people are asking the very logical next set of questions, which is, okay, now I know what not to do. Help me understand how to do this right. And we're working on it. And then gave his speech. Val is meeting with people five days a week. Um, we're really working on moving that conversation forward. Um, yeah, into your own pockets. Come on, guys. Get it together. Um, this here, it says, sometimes you have to fight it out a bit to settle fine details. This court case is not because Ripple is bad. It's the exact opposite. Ripple has been working with the SEC in a transparent matter, head of the class. Let's see what they say. Because actually, I think it's better for an emerging technology like this to set some standards. And Stu, I know you agree because you work at Ripple, one of the leaders in the industry, actually one of the firms that has been crucial to the forming of standards around the various securities law questions, etc. And how did we get from here to there? Because you guys can call him in 
um, and all and Val and all the other amazing people who do what they do and get answers to your questions. Because that Ripple man, they've been great. You heard him right there. I mean, these people are nuts. Um, here it talks about the ICO strategy, which was included in the speech. Um, I think we just watched this. Let's just see real quick. Um, now, just to be clear, the ICO space in particular, I think we had a very significant period where that product was being used in a way that wasn't consistent with the law. Um, and uh, I, of all the many things that I'm proud to work have worked with Jay Clayton on, I am most proud of what the team did to get out ahead of the ICO issue, to be clear that we were, we were going to be forceful about the limits of the law. I think that was difficult as a matter of leadership for Jay to do it. I think it was the right thing to do. I think the team that he put in place did it just right, and I'm very proud of it. Um, now that we've gotten past that part, people are asking the very logical next set of questions, which is, okay, now I know what not to do. Help me understand how to do this right. And we're working on it. Hinman gave his speech. Val is meeting with people five days a week. Um, we're really working on moving that conversation. Yeah, so that was that I had a little bit of an additional um, context there, but still, you get the point. This guy, man, I can't. Sorry, I'm stretching. I can't deal with this this little dude here. Um, I don't know. I'm hoping this isn't getting super repetitive. I can't tell what this look. Just look at his face. I mean, him and. Hinman doesn't look like that much of a schmuck to me, but Jay Clayton and this guy, I mean, what a bunch of jerk-offs, man. It says, I give you the SEC guidance, not Hinman's opinion. Rob, we need to know about this ruling and how this is going to work. We read Hinman's speech on what is a security, and we don't understand where we fall on that spectrum. Let's listen. And I got to tell you, just so you know, in my job, it can be very, very hard to get an unbiased perspective from someone in the marketplace who's gonna, who says... Rob, we need to know what this rule, how this is going to work. Or we read Hindman's speech on what is a security, and we don't understand where we fall on that spectrum, and or we think the speech is wrong, or we don't understand this footnote in it, and all those things. It is harder than you might think for me to get that perspective from the marketplace. When you come in and talk to Val, we get information about what the right rule looks like, and you help us do our job better. Do we help you do your job better? Uh, here DAI comes again. Congress, it may be time to step in here. The buzzards are circling this stink big time. This is how the taxpayer-funded SEC protects investors. Let's watch. I wonder what your Republican dad would think about your view of guidance, Mike. So I guess my question to you will be, are you worried that, you, that guidance has gone too far over the line and is used as a threat rather than as a uh, request for information from the marketplace? Great question. Um, so... Uh, for those of you who didn't hear, just to repeat it, um, he wonders what my Republican dad would think of guidance. Um, or to say it another way, he, uh, what you want to start your name? Ray. Ray. What Ray's wondering is, is guidance really still helpful on the margin um, to entities who are asking for it, or does it come across more as a threat? Um, say a little more about ways in which it could be viewed as a threat. Well, you have an advantage of not actually having to legislate either administratively or through a congressional act. So you have embedded in guidance the ability to actually ignore what the law says mm. and to simply say to the marketplace, look, this is the way we think it's going to be, and if you don't like it, you don't really have any recourse. You can't sue us for guidance. You can't complain to your congressman. You can't give public comment on a rule. In fact, you can't even tell anybody that we had this conversation. So a few things about that. First, some of my colleagues on the commission have expressed real questions about the use of guidance, and indeed, uh, I think um, the White House uh, has recently worried about the, the use of guidance. Um, I think, like any um, uh, action of a government institution, there can be abuses of the kind you're describing, and I would worry about those. But I would also worry about the cases where the market needs guidance, and we haven't provided it. Um, and I would say that the SEC has a really good history of uh, filling in those gaps for the market at moments when they need it. That was my experience in practicing work. Wow. And I understand those of my colleagues who would say, as you pointed out quite correctly, there's risk to making law without the Administrative Procedure Act, without the, um, the uh, democratic controls of the Congress. Um, my own view, just as a footnote, would be that even though I know what, exactly what you mean, when I would call and get guidance, I would take it pretty seriously. On the other hand, it's not actually the law. Um, it's just guidance. Yeah. When you're get, seeking guidance from a regulatory body of the U.S. government, you should be able to walk away with, that, with some like supreme confidence. It's 
crazy. Um, Garlinghouse and Larson's motion to dismiss are, pe- are dismiss are pending before the court. The parties are still conducting fact discovery. Two motions to compel are pending before the magistrate, Judge Netburn, and the parties are requesting leave to conduct two depositions in September. The motion to strike and motion to intervene are still pending, and the expert discovery deadline has been extended to November. In my experience, da 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 da. He doesn't think this will be over anytime soon. Uh, here's the telephone conference. Just, you know, the actual paperwork of it. We already covered that. That will be August 31st at noon. I will be chiming in. If I'm not able to get in on the call, I typically will go live on YouTube. You cannot record it or live broadcast it. It's a federal offense. But there are a few people who basically transcribe it live on Twitter. And typically when that's going on, I will live stream and just basically hop on one of their pages and just keep refreshing and getting it as it comes in. If anybody's interested in that, um, let's go ahead and open that thing up. This is the both parties moving jointly for the brief dist- extension of fact discovery. I'll include the document there. Uh, Ripple requests permission to file a sir reply to the SEC's letters regarding the Slack communications dispute. The request and the sir to supply or sir reply are attached. You know. It says in its reply, the SEC has completely mischaracterized one, Ripple's collection of Slack notification emails to date, extrapolating a potential response at this rate that is off by many multiples, and two, a Slack message regarding Mr. Brad Garlinghouse. Ripple seeks to file the attached sir reply to correct those misstatements in the SEC's reply for the record. And yeah. And again, they're writing on stuff over here, and you know, it's... It's very interesting stuff. Maybe I'll, uh, I guess I can't really screenshot this. I can't, maybe I can still put the, uh, the photo itself in there. I'll try linking that and see if it works, I guess. Um, here is the opposition to defendant's motion to compel the production of internal and interagency documents. Read footnote two in the accompanying text. It says, Mr. Hinman's personal views, XRP are dubious. Um, and then, it, you know, it talks about some of this stuff here, too. So we'll also include that document if you guys want to go check it out. He was referring to the footnote 2 and the accompanying in text. Let's see what we got down here. The SEC ignores that the DPP is a qualified privilege and that this is an extraordinary case. Um... That's what they're talking about. I'm not going to read that. I know this video has been crazy long. I, I want to get off here. That way it doesn't take me eight days to import or uh, upload it. Uh, now, BitBoy Crypto is doubling down on SEC versus Ripple Resolution by mid-September. Says it's the plan. I don't know if he's going to quote his sources that he likes to quote, but let's see what he says. Brad Garlinghouse and Chris Larson, they've asked for the discovery in the case to be pushed back to November 21st. And a lot of people have been saying, well, Bitboy, I heard that you said this was going to be over by the middle of September. And I think it still is going to be. I asked about that this morning. I said, look, like, it, this doesn't look good if they're saying that, you know, this is going to extend all the way until, you know, uh, November of this year. How is it going to be September? That's two months later. And uh, what I was told is basically the legal system right now is dragging their feet, but everything is still the plan. Right now, what's going on is a lot of stuff behind the scenes that we're not seeing. The plan is still the middle of September. So that's pretty bold for me to say that at this point. I'm pretty confident in that information, but I'm not 100% confident on it, like I am on some other things that we've told you. I'm 90% confident in this, and the reason for that is because we're involving the SEC here, and it's a constantly evolving situation that we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but the plan... The plan is still for this thing to be over by the middle of September. And and I think we are still going to see that. I think that this this SEC email is very damning for them. And this could be maybe the final straw to kind of get things uh, going uh, in the right direction. Isn't it crazy that we're still looking for the straw that breaks the camel back? Camel's back. This is one strong ass camel, guys. (laughs) I'm telling you. Uh, And let's not forget... The SEC officials who have launched this thing and were in office at the time are under investigation for conflict of interest in the Ripple lawsuit relating to their connections to the Ethereum Alliance, um, whatever the hell it's called. 
I can't remember what it's just the Ethereum Alliance apparently. Um, they're also all connected to Alibaba and all those ICOs or IPOs over in China. They really helped launch a lot of those sites while slashing out competitors the entire way. Um, here it says later the SEC sued one of Ethereum's competitors, Ripple, declaring it a cryptocurrency. XRP was a security. Shortly thereafter, XRP's value plummeted 25%, and then even further. After Hinman left the SEC in December of 2020, he returned to Simpson Thatcher as a partner. The leader of the SEC division that brought the XRP lawsuit, Mark Berger, simply, similarly left for the SEC for Simpson Thatcher. Uh, they were being paid big money from them while they were there. It's all very interesting. And uh, yeah, Jeremy Hogan, shout out to you. Here he says, of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely ex exercised for the good of its victims is the most oppressive. The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep, but those who torment us for our own good will torment us without the end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. And he highlights the SEC emblem, guys. That's going to do it for me. Um, remember, guys, uh, go Global ID, the XRP... A debit card via Uphold. You can also get the Uphold card, which is, works very similarly. You can spend crypto and fiat for crypto rewards. I've been paying my car insurance, all my utility bills. I'm filling up for gas at the gas station, and I'm getting XRP as a reward on everything, anywhere from 2 to 4%, depending upon when you sign up. It's fantastic. As soon as it goes from pending in the account, it goes right into your rewards thing. Um, with the price of XRP right now, I think it's a great time to get some XRP rewards on my money, especially when it's money I'm already spending. You guys take it easy. Um, I will have a much shorter video for you guys tomorrow.